Good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you this morning and share a little bit from the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be turning to a lot of passages, a lot of stories, if you will. We're going to we're going to go on a little journey this morning, if you will. Um, I titled the message, uh, but who do you say that I am? Um, and it really, what it is, as you boil down, it's really encounters with Jesus Christ and their reactions, specifically their reactions. That's kind of what I'm looking at. So we're going to have a lot of stories we're going to go to. We're going to cover a lot of ground. Uh, we're going to look at stories with Jesus Christ, encounters with him, and their reactions, what happens uh, in those particular situations. Really, though, um, to start off, that's a really great question to start off with. Um, who do you say that I am? Uh, a lot of times today we can run into people and have conversations with them. And, you know, that's a great question to just ask that question and then and then just listen and, and don't try to convert them. Just just listen and just see what they say and have a conversation. Our temptation is to have them converted by the end of that conversation. Um, and, and oftentimes that doesn't work out very well for us. Uh, instead, let's just ask questions. And recently what brought me to this passage really, and, and this idea, I guess, is more of what I'm, what I'm uh, thinking today, just sharing with you kind of what I'm thinking. I read this article a little while ago. Uh, recently, there was a poll talking about um, the number of Americans that believe in God. Maybe you guys saw that. They started taking this poll in 1944, and when that poll was taken in 1944, 98% of the population said they believed in God. And then they did it in 47 and got the same result. And they did it again in um, the 50s and the 60s and got the same result. 98% said they believe in God. Well, they took it in 1992, and the number dropped from 98% to 92%. So it went backwards. It took, what, 50 years roughly to drop six points roughly, six percentage points. And they took it again in 2022. Anyone want to take a guess at the number? 81. 81. She's right on the money. They took it in um, 2011, it was 92. In 2020, 81. So Basically, 10 years, it drops 11 points. I guess my point is there is a rapid decline in the number of people that believe in God. And I think our experience in culture would agree with that statement. We see a departure. We see a departure. So it's a great time to get back to talk about Jesus Christ. And that's what brings me to our passage today. Because um, we're going to get varied reactions to these conversations, right? Very different reactions from a lot of different people. So let's just ask the Lord to bless his word. And we're going to jump in. The first passage we're going to jump to is Matthew 13. Matthew 13. I got to get there myself. Let's pray. Our Father, we do um, just bow in your presence at this moment. We just ask you to shine light on the page, to light in our hearts, to have us just look into what you've put here before us today, Father. Open our eyes so we might see and know of what you'd have for us and ask your blessing on our time together as we share a little bit about the person of the Lord Jesus. Amen. So in Matthew 13, I got to get there myself. Like I said, we're going to flip a bunch of passages. Um, and, and about midway into that passage, somewhere around uh, verse 55 or so, I'll jump in at 53, and it says this, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables, he departed, and when he was into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished. Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? and his brother, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the question comes out, here he is speaking, they see his wisdom, his mighty works, and they're saying, he can't be the carpenter's son. 
And one time I was under a speaker that I respect very much, and he rephrased it a little bit. He, he took a little bit of embellishment and he changed the question to this. Whose son is he? If he's not the carpenter's son, whose son is he? It's a great question. Whose son is he? And you think about what they were saying about him. My translation said in, in verse uh, 54 that they were astonished. Now, I look around this room and I know many people have been in the assemblies and in meetings for many, many years and heard many, many messages. How many times have you been astonished by what you've heard? I'm willing to bet it's not more than three times, maybe five, I'm not sure. But more than likely, you didn't leave the Sunday morning meeting astonished by what you've heard, right? This man is different. Take that in, right? This man is different. Whose son is he? They're trying to figure it out. Whose son is he? Let's look at their reaction. What do you think it's going to be, right? Verse 57. My translation says, and they were offended in him. They were just saying they were astonished by what he did, all his miracles and all his teachings, and yet they're offended in him. They refused to believe in him. Hard to take in, right? They were just saying they were astonished with him. And yet they refused to believe in him. They refused to believe in him. Next story. We're going to start moving pretty quick here because it is, there's a lot. I got a lot down here to look at. But in uh, chapter 14, around verse 25, it's right after the feeding of the 5,000. And he puts the disciples in the ship and he sends them uh, across the way. And uh, he's walking on water. We know this story well. I'm not going to read the whole story um, in verse 28. Um, but in, in the middle of the night, they, they see Jesus walking on the sea. Amazing thing to see. I would be astonished. They were astonished. And when the disciples saw him walking, they were afraid. Um, and they said it was a spirit and they cried out for fear. And Peter has enough boldness to say, if it be you, Lord, let me come to you. And I would love to know the tone that he asked that question, wouldn't you? Because you know tone and body language mean something today, right? And I would love to know the tone that he asked that, but it's not, we, we can't, I'll, I'll ask him someday, I guess. Um, uh, but if, if it be thou, Lord, bid me come unto you and walk on the water. And Peter had enough courage to get out of the boat and starts to walk on the water. And that would be pretty amazing, except he started to drown. We know the story. And this is how good our Lord is, right? Because you be, Peter, you got out of the boat. You shouldn't have got out of that boat and just kick him down. Why'd you do that? It's not the character of our Lord, right? We mess up. He's there. He helps us. He always does. But Peter got out of the boat. And again, he reached out, he saved him when he called it. And I want to look at verse 32. And when the wind had ceased, they all got into the ship. What's the reaction? And they did, they were in the ship, came and worshiped him. Remember our question, who art thou? They answered it. Of a truth, thou art the son of God. Of the truth, thou art the Son of God. The question was answered in their mind who Jesus Christ was. They knew he was the Son of God. And the scriptures continue on with this thought in chapter 16 also. The question pops up again. And uh, we know the context of that, of that story. Uh, jump in around uh, verse 13 of chapter 16 of Matthew. And when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am, the Son of Man am? And they throw out some very good names, right? John the Baptist, some say. And some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Those are some good names to be associated with. 
but he takes it a little step further. He drills down a little more. And it's the same question we all have to ask ourselves. But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And the reason I wanted to interject this story is Peter, right? Peter answers, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And I'm going to bet he made that statement based on his experience with Jesus Christ. In other words, he had an experience that just doesn't happen in daily life. It's just not normal. In other words, he knew beyond a shadow of doubt that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And I would submit to you that Jesus Christ in 2022 still gives us evidence to know that he is real, that he is active in our lives, that he is moving in places. He is still the Lord of all. He is still moving in his church. He is still answering prayers. And Peter knew it, and I believe we knew it. Uh, we know it as well in our lives. And now I want to jump back to Matthew 8. Between Matthew 8 and, chap and, and, and Matthew 10, there's like 10 miracles that happen. And I think they um, kind of speak a little bit to where we're trying to go today. So let's jump back to chapter 8 of Matthew. And, um, and then we're going to jump through. We're not going to hit all 10. We're going to hit maybe five or six. And then we're going to move on to uh, John's gospel. Um, but in Matthew 8, the first, first miracle that happens is the leper that comes to him. And it says this uh, in verse 2 of Matthew 8. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said in verse 4, and Jesus said to him, See that you tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priests, and offer a gift that Moses commanded for a testimony to them. So I love this passage. It's one of the first things. Lepers had no hope of being healed, right? How many lepers have been healed in the Bible? I thought there was one, Miriam. Remember, Miriam didn't want Moses to be leader in that in God. And, and then there's one more, Naaman, Naaman in 2 Kings 5. So there's two lepers that I can tell you are healed in the Bible. Maybe a third with Moses when he put his hand in and put it out again. So two, okay? Why did Jesus send the man to the priest for a testimony to them? Let's just kick that around just for a second. So two lepers were healed. Um, Moses asked God to heal Miriam. And in Naaman's case, the prophet was there, and he told him to go wash in the, in the, river, in the river, and he washed and was cleansed. Okay. So when this man, this leper, comes and is commanded to go to the priest, what message should have the priest thought when they found a leper that was cleansed? Think that through for a second. It's not said in scripture, but this is... So they should have known that either God is here or at least a prophet is here. Because those are the only two times that a leper has been cleansed. That's why it's the first miracle, I believe. I would submit that only. God is present. God is on the property. It should have been a huge red flag to them. But they didn't get it. But look at the leper. He sought out the Lord Jesus, right? He worshiped the Lord Jesus. He didn't demand or expect to be healed. He just said, if you will, powerful words. And he worshiped Jesus whether or not he got healed. I thought that was great that he came to him that way. In the very next story, something a little bit more um, Entertaining, if you will, exciting, miraculous, you name it, right? But it builds on that same point. 
You know, when you read scriptures and you look at them and your know, story builds upon story, builds upon story. Look at this one. In verse 8, the censure, uh, when Jesus entered in verse 5, I'm sorry, when Jesus entered in, into Capernaum, there came into him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievingly tormented. And he asked him to come, and Jesus says, I will come and heal him. In verse 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, he called him Lord. The leper called him Lord also. Who is Jesus Christ? The leper called him Lord, so did the centurion. Lord, I am not worthy to, that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak a word, and my servant shall be healed. Did the centurion know who was on the property? Right? The centurion. I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say, come uh, to this man, and he goes and doeth it to another. Come, and he cometh, and my servant doeth this and doeth that. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said uh, to them that followed, Verily, verily, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, no, not in Israel. Isn't it interesting? You got a leper who understands that God is on a property, and you got a centurion who understands that God is on a property. But the leaders don't. But the leaders don't. And it goes on, a little more evidence. Uh, jump down to verse 14. And when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid sick of the fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she arose, and she ministered unto them. We're not looking at her reaction here in, in this sense, but her reaction is like, if you're sick and you're a fever, and you have a fever and, and you're healed like that, how long does it take to get your strength back? It doesn't come back immediately, right? She got up and immediately started serving. It just shows how great he is, right? He is a great Savior. Jump over to uh, verse 24. Verse 24. A uh, great tempest in the sea, in so much that the ship was covered in the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us or we perish. And they say to him, why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? And he arose and rebuked the winds in the sea, and there was a great calm. Verse 27, and the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? They had more experience to see what he had done, miraculous things. We wish we could control the weather. We can't control anything. But he could control the waves of the sea. Amazing. Amazing. We're just going to plow through and keep keep going on looking at these stories and maybe some of the highlights. But then the same, the very next story, the very next story and how it builds. Two possessed with devils coming out of a tomb. And uh, they were exceeding fierce that no one would pass by that way. And they had cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? The devils knew who he was, calling him Jesus, the son of God. And they asked to be thrown into this herd of cattle and, and Jesus permits it and they go down and they drowned. And let's look at the reaction. Verse 33. And they that kept them fled and went their way into the city and told everything and what was befallen to the possessed by the devils. And behold, the reaction, and behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they besought him that, and check this out, that he would depart out of their coast. They saw what he had done. He'd healed two people that no one would even walk by because they were afraid. A miracle had been done. And their reaction? Go away. Depart. I don't want you here. Crazy. Keep that kind of stuff as we go into John. We're going to go to John's gospel now. I'm going to skip to another story. But for sake of time, let's go to John chapter 1. I'm going to grab the water. This is okay, right? John chapter one. More stories. We know all these stories. We do, but I like stringing them together. And really, you know, hopefully when we leave here today, we're going to leave with 
a, a, a refreshed picture, a refreshed thoughts about the Lord Jesus. Um, story of Nathaniel, uh, John chapter 1, uh, verse 45. And uh, we're going to pick up the pace a little bit. Um, Philip sees the Lord Jesus, goes, gets Nathaniel, brings him to the Lord Jesus. And uh, I like Phil, Philip's method of evangelism when we we're talking about conversations earlier. Uh, he didn't try to convert them. He just said, come and see. Maybe that's what we ought to do, right? Come and see the Lord for yourself. We don't have to have a long conversation about it. Just come and see. Let me introduce you to him. That's what Philip did with Nathaniel. And, uh, and he introduces him to them. And we're going to, for sake of time, look in verse 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. And Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before uh, Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw him. I saw thee. Nathanael's reaction. Nathanael answered and said to him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God, thou art the king of Israel. Two things is all it took for Nathanael to realize that he was the son of God. One, he saw him under the fig tree. I don't know what he was doing under the fig tree, doesn't say. And two, he knew of his character. He said, there is no guile in you, or there's no like Jacob in you, you're not the deceiver. So he knew his character. And that was enough for Nathaniel to say, of a truth, you are the son of God. Very impressive. He knew right who he was. So we have Nathaniel uh, added to our list. And now let's go to John chapter 4. Uh, for the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, if you will. At, at the well, if you will. And the Lord Jesus goes there, right? And, um, and he has a meeting with her, if you will. Um, and he asks her for water, and, and she says, why are you asking me for water? The Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Why are you doing that? And he makes a claim in verse 10, and he said, Jesus answered and said to her, thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, give me a drink, uh, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. What a claim. Jesus says, um, if you knew who I was, you'd ask for me for a drink, and I'd give you living water. It's under, you know, underlying living water in our mind here, living water. And he goes on, right? He goes on. Uh, it goes down, it'll jump down to verse uh, 15, roughly. And the woman saith to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. And Jesus replies and said, Go, call thy husband and come hither. And a woman in answer and said, I have no husband. I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said you have no husband, for thou hast had five, and he whom you have now is not your husband. And at this point, the Samaritan says, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Right? I perceive thou art a prophet. Look at verse 28. We're going to jump down. Look at the woman's reaction. And then the responses. The woman left her water pot. That's her reaction. She came there to give water. And she left it. Do you think she found her living water? She left her water pot. That's amazing. Then what she did. And she went her way to the city. And said, come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? She recognized him. A Samaritan recognized him just by the conversation. Jump down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him, saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Verse 40. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would leave, that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two more days. The Samaritans said, don't go. What did we just read in Matthew 8? See you later. Which, 
<laughs> the Samaritans were not supposed to be these people, right? I think the lesson for us is we can't just go judge who is going to accept him and who is not going to accept him. We just have to go share about him. Because surprising enough, the Samaritan said, stay. I would assume it was the Jews in Matthew 8 that told them to leave. Kind of crazy. Oops. I think the next passage we're going to go to is um, John 6. John 6. We're going to jump in at verse 30, jump into the story. It's another story that we know well, but Jesus makes it clean here. And I also want to look at the reactions again. So um, in verse 30, they said to him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? So they're questioning him. What are you going to do for us? What are you going to show us? And he says, um, you know, your fathers did eat manna in the desert. And, uh, you know, Moses uh didn't give you that bread, but my father gave it to him. And he makes a claim in verse 35. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Believe that he that cometh uh, to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And we know this tripped them up, right? Because he made that claim, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger and believe on me shall never thirst. And he says it again in verse 48, that I am the bread of life. And um, for those that like um, numbers and numerology in the Bible, look at verse 66. Verse 66, maybe you already knew that. John 6 and 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. It was a hard saying. And they walked away. Many of his people walked away. They weren't going to follow him. But not everybody said that, right? Because it says in the next verse, it said, And Jesus said unto the, the twelve, Will you go away also? And Peter steps up, Lord, to whom shall we go? For thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Some left, the disciples stayed. They were sure. They knew that he was the living God. John chapter 9. We're moving forward quickly here. I realize that. But we're getting to the end. Another story we know well. So we've learned that Jesus is the bread of life, that he is the living water. And in John 9, another man born blind. We're not going to read the story for sake of time. Man's born blind, and a question is asked. Um, and um, verse 2, um, who did this sin, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? And Jesus said, neither, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. And in verse 5, it says, as I... As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So Jesus claimed to be the light of the world, the bread of life, the living water. Three, three things so far. And we go on and we know this man is healed and it causes a controversy. Um, the leaders of the day, uh, the Pharisees, how did you get healed? Uh, he tells them the story. They don't believe him. Um, not good enough. So they go get his parents bring them down, let's get them under the spotlight. Uh, same deal, um, they say he's old enough, ask him, right, ask him. And it says in uh, verse 16, and there was a division among them. <laughs> there was a division among them, that's pretty interesting. There was a division among them. We'll jump down to verse 30. So he's still going through this, they're asking him these questions. And uh, it says this in verse 30, the man answered and said to them, we're herein is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he heareth him. 
Since the world began, it is not heard that any man's eyes uh, of the one that were born blind have been opened. If this man were not of God, he can do nothing. This man became a believer and the Pharisees didn't. Isn't that something? And he, that happened through experience, right? His eyes were open. I mean, it's a miracle. Never been done. But this man was a believer. And uh, it says that in verse um, 38. And Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. John chapter 20, we're, we're run, winding it down. This was when Jesus revealed himself uh, to them after the resurrection. And it says this, the same day at the evening being the first day of the week, the doors were shut. And the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be unto you. And when he had said that, he showed them his hands and his side. And when the disciples, uh, then the disciples were glad when they saw that it was the Lord. And Jesus said unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even though I send you. And when he said this, he had breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He breathed on them and gave them the gift of the Holy Ghost. We know Thomas wasn't with them, right? We know that story. Thomas wasn't with them. And Thomas basically said, Hey, I'm not going to believe until I can put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into the side, I'm not going to believe. I'm just not going to do it. And remember that I said that thing about evidence, right? Evidence. The Lord um, will give you as much evidence you, as you need. And he did that with Thomas. He came to him and appeared and told him to put in your finger and your hands in my side. And it made him a believer. And it says this in, uh, in verse 30. In many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Verse 31. But these are written. Why are they written? What is the purpose? What are we talking about today, right? Who do you say that I am? These are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you have life through his name, in his name. That's what it's all about. That is what it's all about, folks. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and finding life in his name. Because you won't find it any place else. You won't find it any place else. Science will tell us that we need four things to live. If you're a science person, we need four things to live. We need water. We need air, we need food, and we need light. What have we been learning about in the book of John the past 10 minutes, right? I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the light of the world. And he breathes into his disciples in this passage, even though that might be a little controversial, but it still fits what I want to go. <laughs> We need Jesus Christ. We know who he is. We know what he can do. We need him for life. And this world, even though it's getting darker, and as we've said this morning, that it is on the decline, there's less people that believe in God. There's also people that are still searching. And he is still the light of the world. And he can still satisfy them. He can still feed them. He can still heal them. He hasn't lost his power. It's not done yet. We still have a little ways to go. So let's remember who Jesus is. Let's pray. Our Father, this morning, we've just pondered and just scratched the surface a little bit about the person of your son, the Lord Jesus, Father. And may we not lose grasp with him as our days get cloudy. 
and things come into our lives. Remember who he is, that he died to save the world, that you sent him to save the world and whosoever would believe. Father, we give you thanks this morning that your word is still truthful. It's still uh, relevant and makes sense to us. You've put your spirit into us to help us understand it. We give you thanks this morning for just this little time we spent just gleaning these thoughts this morning. We give you thanks in your son's name, the Lord Jesus. Amen.